मैडम हेलो मैडम हाँ बोलो हाँ शुरू कर दिन अच्छा बेस्टाहले आज के शुरू कोरी शुभ शंधा नमस्कार वेस्ट बंगाल पॉलिटिकल साइंस एसोसिएशन के तौर पर के आरेक्टी आज के वेबिनार के आयोजन करा गया था एवं आमिर को आनंद शंघे बोल ची जे प्रोफेसर शमीर कुमार दाश दाश शंघे आमर एकाधिक जगह देखा हुए थे आमिर अनेक दिन आगे उनके उन्नत करे चिला जे आमदे जे वेबिनार चोल ची जे बेश को एक टाइम आलोचना इधरे कोरे ची विभिन्न लोग उन्हें मानुषी शे बोले चे तो तादेव मध्य आमी तादेव मध्य अब 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 शोमी बोल के पे ची तो प्रोफेसर शोमी दाशे राला तक कोरे कोरी ची फिर कोनो कोरे जोन नहीं किंतु आनुष्ठा निक भावे आम एक टाइम लोगों के कोरी काजी प्रोफेसर शोमी कुमार दाश ए मुहूर्त था पर एवं ताशों के तीनी इंडियन फॉर्म पॉलिसी स्टडीज़ एरो बाई तेरो है चं तीनी ये आगे तीनी प्राक्तन उपाचार जो चीरे मुख्य बंगो विश्वविद्यालय जीन हिसेबे कोलकाता विश्वविद्यालय फैकल्टी ऑफ आर्ट्स से दिन बाई कुछ चीने ये जहाँ तार जे आप एकेडमिक काज करने समुद्र में शामिल � सर्विसे जॉर्जटन यूनिवर्सिटी की शोभे चुकते रहे थे। तार विभागे जे यूजीसी डीआरएस प्रोग्राम और डेमोक्रेटिक गवर्नमेंट्स तार दायित्व तीन चले चुके। ये छाराओं तेरी अशोक को जाएगा देशे एवं विदेशे उत्थापना कोरे चुके, आमंत्रण कोरे चुके, विजिटिंग प्रोफेसर यूनिवर्सिटी सोबोन पैरीते तबे ता लेटेस्ट बॉय जेटा तीनी शॉपदाना कोरे चेन बीचने पूरा बैशर शोंगे शेटा नाम अमी उल्लेख कोची द मेकिंग ऑफ गॉडेस ऑफ दुर्गा इन बंगाल आर्ट हेरिटेज एंड पब्लिक एटी इस प्रिंगर और तो सिंगापुर तो ले बेरीये चे यहाँ जेले कुशे आज तीनी आमादे के जी भी शाय बोल बेन शेटा हम आगे तो इशानी एवं अपुर बो दुजानेर का चीज जेने नहीं। आमार संगे अपुर बो जेटु को कथा हुए चिलो ताते आमाकी इंग्लिश ते बालबार उन्नरोत पढ़ा हुए चे। तो आमी इंग्लिश ते बोली। हाँ कुनो आशुभे देने। आमार धारण अपुर बो दर मुद्दे आपुते थक गए ना अपने जेते शांत संगे। किंतु आमी स्वाभाव हमने इंग्लिशी बांग्ला दूसरों भाषाई व्यवहार को भी तो सो फर्स्ट ऑफ़ ऑल लेट मी बिगिन विथ अ वर्ड ऑफ़ थैंक्स टू वेस्ट बंगाल पॉलिटिकल साइंस एसोसिएशन टू प्रोफेसर ईशानी नौशकोड एंड प्रोफेसर ओपुर वो मुखबद्धा फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी टू शेयर व्हाट आई स्टिल कंसीडर एस सम ऑफ़ माय uh, uncertain thoughts with all of you. Now, let me first of all tell you why I have selected developmental democracy as a theme of today's discussion. Uh, all of us know that democracy uh, covers a lot of ground in our syllabus, whether it is of Calcutta University or Jadavpur University or North Bengal University, whichever university you think of, uh, you see democracy figuring in any syllabus on political theory, on political sociology, on comparative politics. And also you have aspects of democracy being taught under the courses of politics in India or Indian politics. So I thought that I should speak on democracy, but then suddenly I realized that the way, for instance, I studied democracy or I assume that all of us have studied democracy or for that matter, the way we understand democracy, whether in India or elsewhere, 
has become somewhat old fashioned nowadays a term is being used several terms in fact are in circulation for instance populist democracy is one such term uh, and we will not discuss populist democracy today uh, maybe that it will come very indirectly in parts of our discussion but i thought that there is another term which has acquired some ground some importance particularly in recent years which is developmental democracy development is the buzzword now it is being used in political economy in any syllabus on political science in popular parlance as well in media as well you can't think without development today so i thought that let me first of all try to figure out what developmental democracy is in order to assess how much old fashioned our way of studying and teaching democracy is and so that it gives us an occasion to sort of equip ourselves with somewhat up to date understanding of what democracy is so it is out of this necessity that i thought that development democracy could be a topic of discussion uh i will show a few slides but these slides are not very important uh because they i mean only five or six slides which i have hurriedly prepared but let me first of all tell you what i am going to uh sort of cover in course of today's discussion and give me a minute i will take you to the slides which i have prepared for you uh, i don't know whether this will make sense uh this will be yes i don't know whether uh it can be seen uh ishani can you see it shobita as of now i'm not being able to see it just says that you're okay. about to present okay it's all right uh, so i i don't think that the connectivity in my Uh, at my end is strong enough to to be able to show the slides which i have prepared but doesn't matter uh let me sort of first of all tell you the scheme of today's discussion uh first of all we will i will sort of allude to two stories one relating to the fallout of the acquisition of land in singur and i'm sure that all of us are familiar with it with this story but it's important that we repeat some of the aspects of this story so that you know that we can tease out the theoretical implications of this story the second story is the repeal of three farm laws which the parliament of india legislated back in 2019 uh, the repeal was uh, was done through a piece of legislation in the year 2020 all of us are familiar with that so i will allude to these stories and because these stories reflect a lot on the connection between development and democracy and so i have picked up these two stories uh, as the starting point for today's discussion uh, the in the second part of our discussion we will so sort of try to find out the connection mostly in theoretical terms but with a lot of examples to the extent time permits me to do that uh the theoretical implications of the connection between development and democracy because when you talk about developmental democracy it's a combined uh word it's a combination of two words development and democracy so what is the kind of connection how much democratic is development uh, or development is or 
how much how much of development does democracy allow uh, so these will be the questions which will figure in our second part of our discussion in the third part i will reflect on uh, democracy's theory of people although we talk about democracy you know that the cliche definition that uh, that one usually remembers is a famous quote from abraham lincoln that democracy is of the people for the people by the people but democracy never i mean takes people for granted but does democracy have any theory of people so these are the three ways of three parts of my discussion in the fourth part if possible i will sort of draw your attention to the mediating institutions you know that mediating institutions mediating meaning mediating between the governors and the governed they play a very important role and when we talk about mediating institutions we talk about political parties pressure groups interest groups and today you know that now fashionable civil society organizations or csos so basically it's a four uh, part scheme of discussion and i will sort of uh try to touch upon each of these parts but then at the end we will keep some time for discussion and i i'm sure that we have uh we will have time for discussion <clears throat> i will sort of make sure that we will have time for discussion so let me uh, begin uh you know that the first story is relating to the acquisition of land in singhu I remember that this was on 11th of May 2006 you know that election results were being declared and I remember that I was part of a uh, part of a uh, sort of commentary in one of the TV channels and this was a time when I did a lot of TV uh, shows TV interviews some of you might know this that on 11th of may to 2006 the election results were coming out and you know that there was a massive victory of cpim in the evening i had the opportunity of interviewing one of the very senior leaders of uh, cpim uh, subhash chakraborty uh, you are familiar with him he was the transport minister he was the sports minister and a very sort of trusted veteran uh, member of the communist party of india marxist so i was interviewing him and i asked him that how do you read this massive victory of cpim uh pat came his reply he said that we take it as uh, a mandate in favor of industrialization you remember that the famous slogan at that point of time which cpim uh, or for that matter many of the left parties came out with was krishi amader bhitti shilpo amader bhavishya agriculture is our foundation industry is our future so subhash chakraborty said in no uncertain terms that that this is a mandate in favor of industrialization which means that once we are in power then obviously you know that we will go full swing with industrialization uh so this is uh and you, you know that immediately after the election results were out and the government was formed immediately thereafter land was acquired in singur and then you know the subsequent story the whole hell broke loose cpim or for that matter the left front led government came to a limbo almost for 5 years and then in 2008 tatas decided to leave singur all of us are familiar with it in 2016 for instance the famous court verdict came which said that the land acquisition was not in compliance with the procedures that had to be followed because it was basically the idea was that the land was acquired by the government from a private party in order to benefit a private party so the whole understanding of public purpose which was an integral part of the 1894 act 
uh, Land Acquisition Act uh, was not adhered to. That was what the court said. Uh, so this was this is the first story. I'm just sort of all of us are familiar with this story, but I'm just reminding you of some of the highlights of this story because uh, I will be referring back and forth to this story in course of my presentation. The second story relates to the three farm laws. Uh, and I would say that it actually triggered a controversy. And if you ask me that what was this controversy about, I would say that basically twofold. On the one hand, the parliament uh, parliament passed this legislation, and then I quote from Indian Express, which said without any discussion. So there was no discussion in parliament on, on the three farm laws, but these laws were passed without any discussion. That was first criticism. So you know that the procedure, parliamentary procedure, was not followed, and it should have been followed. The second problem was that the this was actually uh, a move uh, towards commercialization of agriculture, which would put the peasants into disadvantage, the farmers into disadvantage. Uh, one of the examples that comes to my mind at this moment is that, you know, that the government decided to do away with minimum, uh, minimum MSP or minimum security price. Uh, particularly of certain kind, certain commodities. So the, the the many of the farmers they wanted this minimum secure support price. I'm sorry, minimum support price to exist so that you know that the farmers' interests could be protected. And then you all of you know that farmers from, particularly from Punjab, from Haryana, from Rajasthan, and from Uttar Pradesh, neighboring Uttar Pradesh actually assembled on, in the outs, on the outskirts of uh, Delhi, not too far from parliament. And they were staying there till this, these three uh, laws were taken back, the exact English word for this was repeal. So the repeal was done in the year 2020. All of us are aware, aware of it. Uh, now, if you look at these two cases very closely, I think that there are at least three similarities. The first similarity is that, uh, that in both cases, you know that the actions uh, in terms of legislation were done by duly elected body. For instance, parliament, for instance, the West Bengal Legislative Assembly, and I mean Vidhan Sabha. So as far as, and, and, and you know that whether it's parliament or it's Vidhan Sabha, it is authorized to, to, to take such action. So this is the first point of similarity. The second is that in both cases, the action was done in the name of development. So you know that development was a key word. So in the first case, industrialization was the, was the step towards development. In the second case, agricultural reforms was supposed to be indispensable to India's further progress, particularly in the agricultural sector. In other words, you know that the same word development comes in. The third similarity is that in both cases, these actions were annulled by the same bodies that actually took resort to these actions. So the parliament decided to repeal these three farm laws. And then you have, for instance, the West Bengal Legislative Assembly subsequently decided to, uh, to restore the land to the peasants, whether or not the land could be restored to the peasants, whether or not land became cultivable is a different issue. But you know that the same legislative board bodies literally ate back the words that they promised to the people. So far about similarity, but there is one fundamental dissimilarity between these two cases. 
The dissimilarity lies in the fact that the Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, could understand in well in advance what, for instance, the Chief Minister could not understand. Chief Minister, the then Chief Minister was Buddha Dev Bhattacharya, we all know that. So he kept on saying that we have come to power with, with a massive electoral majority. Remember his words, Amra we are 235, they are 30. So he was insistent on the fact that since they have won the elections, so they have a right to frame laws and there is no question of taking back the law. But on the other hand, Prime Minister Modi, he could realize that these three legislations, even if were done by a duly authorized body, had to be repealed. Remember his speech to the nation in support of the repeal. He said, and he delivered the speech in Hindi. I tried to translate some parts of it so that we can share it with you. He said, for instance, that it is apparent that there must have been some deficiency in our penance. Tapasya is the word which he used. Deficiency in our tapasya, in our penance. And then he said that we could not probably make people of the whole country. Remember this phrase is important and this will keep coming back in our discussion. People of the whole country, we could not make them understand the properly the benefits of these three farm laws, which were otherwise apparent or evident to those who actually did the legislation, all the members of parliament, and which was very clear to them. And then he used an analogy, he said that which was as clear as the light of the lamp. So what they could understand as, as a clear case of development, the people failed to understand. So it's important, it was important for, the, for his party to make people understand the benefits. And he is prepared for waiting till people understand this. So this was a fundamental dissimilarity. The chief minister was insisting on the electoral majority. I use this term in order to understand the nature of the difference between the chief minister and the prime minister. Chief Minister Buddha Dev Bhattacharya was insisting on the issue of electoral majority. And his argument was very simple that because we have one election, and so we have a right to frame laws. But on the other hand, here is the Prime Minister who is saying that the people of the whole country is very important. Now, certainly these two concepts are not the same. The electoral majority and people of the whole country are not the same. You, can, you cannot, for instance, say that electoral majority is equal to people of the whole country or we the people of India, for instance that our constitution began with. So you know that we, the people of India, consists of the electoral majority plus the electoral minority, or you can say electorally impaired minority, a minority which could not become majority. The people, who, for instance, the nota voters, for instance, or for instance, the non-voters. There are citizens who are not voters in India. So what about them? In other words, you know that electoral majority is not equal to the people. And therein lies the dis distinction, the difference between what the chief minister said and what the prime minister said. In other words, I would say that the challenge of developmental democracy is this, that even if you win the elections, and in both cases, you know that 
the chief minister as well as the prime minister, their parties, their alliances came to power by way of winning elections. It doesn't mean that they will be successful in passing legislations in the way they want. So developmental democracy in that sense is a challenge. And I tried to understand, I tried to look back into political theory in order, order to understand the distinction between electoral majority on the one hand and the people on the other, we the people of India, for instance, on the other. So I am now moving over to the second part, which is a bit theoretical. And the second part, where we are going to discuss what the electoral majority is and how this distinction between electoral majority and the people has been dealt with in, in political theory. Now, on the one hand, you know that when you talk about people, I think that the term people figures very eloquently in the writings of Spinoza, a philosopher about whom we, the students of political science, know very little. But his political writings are now available. And I'm referring to a text which Spinoza wrote sometime in 1670. I'm very bad at remembering the, word, the, the dates which is called Tractatus Theologico-Politicus. Basically, you know that political theological treatise, that's the title of the book, where Spinoza says that the people, he, he, he uses the term people, highlights the importance of people in a democracy, although you know that he understood by democracy, he understood something which is different from the way we understand democracy today. But the most important point that he wanted to make is this, that the people is not, and then he used a phrase which I want to share with you, is not ferocious multitude. In other words, you know that the, you know what ferocious multitude means. It means that people who are sort of a, an unruly crowd which is fighting amongst themselves and then cannot be called a people. In other words, Spinoza says that democracy's challenge is to discipline the ferocious multitude into a disciplined people, an orderly people. And then he said that once the people comes into being, you know that the individual rights can be protected, can be ensured. So if, for instance, people fight amongst themselves, they cannot be called people. They can be called people only when you know that there is order and stability amongst them. And it is by way of establishing the order and stability that the individuals who form the people could be entitled to certain rights. That was what Spinoza was talking about. So you have a theory of people that way. Abraham Lincoln simply said democracy is a government of the people, for the people, by the people. And you know that you can actually see in, in most of the writings on democracy, not so much about people, but about how people can play a role in the functioning of the government. So they don't, they hardly talk about who the people are, how the people come into being. Rather the focus of democratic theory has been on how can people be factored in, how can they exercise their influence, how can they play a role in making decisions. That's very unfortunate because, you know, unless you can, you can make out who the people are, it becomes absolutely unimportant how, for instance, people can play a role or whether at all they can play a role. And that's the reason why, for instance, I looked back to Spinoza in order to develop some clarity about who the people are. So this is one kind of understanding. 
But on the other hand, and you, you can say that, that when, for instance, Prime Minister Modi was talking about people, he was certainly not referring to electoral majority. He was certainly referring to people of the whole country. This was his phrase. On the other hand, when, for instance, Chief Minister was referring to electoral majority, he was probably referring to a great political theorist, John Stuart Mill, and you know that his book, Considerations on Representative Government, which came out in 1860, once again, uh, uh, yes, 1860, about 200 years later. So he was, his central argument is, and I'm sure that many of us have read uh, Considerations on Representative Government, because this was a text which was used to be taught at the undergraduate level at one point of time. Uh, this was not certainly in, the, in my syllabus, but this was part of the syllabus, particularly uh, for the older generations. Now, Mill was making this argument, and then if I can quote some of the sentences which Mill uses, particularly in the initial parts of the book, he argues, for instance, that individual rights can be better protected if the individuals are allowed to play a role in making the government. In other words, that's the central argument of, of representative government, that if people get a chance to represent themselves, then it is likely that their interests will be protected. And how do you represent? When you talk about representation, you certainly talk about representatives who represent the people. And what would be the mechanism? He was referring to elections, certainly. So the mechanism of representative government elections and it is that you can actually split the people into majority and the minority. And the majority has the privilege of forming the government or has the right to form the government. That was Mill. And this was certainly not Spinoza. Because no. Spinoza's emphasis was on the whole people. And Mill's emphasis is on electoral majority. All right. Is there any way by which, for instance, and this is a question which I, I ask at the third level, is there any way by which, for instance, electoral majority and the people can be intertwined? Can we actually connect the electoral majority with the people? I think if you pose this question in this way, then, of course, you know that you have two answers to this question. One answer, which is conveyed through a phrase, and I'm sure that many of us have are familiar with this phrase, have heard this phrase, which is called developmental nationalism, which is doing the rounds nowadays in, 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 the, in much of the theoretical literature of political science, developmental nationalism. So it means basically two things. On the one hand, it means that anyone who is opposed to development is to be considered as anti-national. So you know that when, for instance, the movement in Singur or the movement in Nandigram were happening, you know that the Many, many, many government leaders, for instance, used to brand these as the doing of the anti-national elements, much in the same way as, for instance, the, the central government accused a section of farmers of being a hand in glove with the Khalistanis. You remember that, who are anti-nationals. 
So you know that if you are opposed to development, then you are certainly not with the nation. Because you can't think of nation without development. You can't think of development without national development. Because after all, whose development are you talking about other than that of the nation? So that's one part of the story. But the other part of the story is that democracy is geared to the task of building up a consensus in favor of development. Which means what? Which means that if you are not part of this consensus, then obviously you know that you are not a true nationalist. And in most of the cases, wherever you see movements against land acquisition, whether it's in Niyamgiri or it's in West Bengal or it's in Punjab, you see the same story or it's in Nasik, for instance. You see the same story being repeated nauseatingly where, for instance, the people opposed to development are immediately shot down as anti-nationals. All right. Please allow me to read uh, a few lines from uh, a famous poem which Shankho Ghosh wrote uh, in 2018. And the title of this poem is Mukto Ganotantra or Open Democracy. Now, those of you who don't understand Bengali, please hold on. I will translate it for you in my own way with discount, of course. Let me read it out. Uh, I will read it first in Bengali because I think that nothing can actually capture the crux of developmental nationalism more than Shankha Ghosh's poem, which is Mukto Ganutantra. Shabai Shuthu Mithya Rotai Padguli shab dedar khula, jar khushi ai birud thotai. In other words, you know that it's some sort of a sarcasm which says that everyone is spreading lie across the society that those of us who are in favor of development are opposed to any kind of dissent being voiced against development which is not true. So if you are, if you insist on voicing your dissent, be it, you, you can do it. There is that nothing should prevent you from voicing your dissent. But then the next three lines are very important. I'm sorry, it's a very controversial poem because you know that he had a spat with one of the very famous at that point of time, very famous leaders of the ruling party. Please allow me to read the next three lines. So you know that it's an allusion to the third eye of Lord Shiva. And you can see the future through your third eye. Rasta jude khorgo hate. So you know that these two words are very important. Rasta jude, blocking the road. So development is blocking the road. You can't, so you, there is no escape. You are forced to develop. You can't say no to development. Rasta jude, khorgo hate. So, so the, the first part is that you can't, that there's no escape. You can't escape development. You are destined to develop. Much in the same way as Rousseau wrote, you are forced to be free. And then the second part of the same, same line is Khorgo Hate. Now Khorgo is not an ordinary weapon. It's a heavy sword. It's a heavy sword which has its connection with animal sacrifice at the altar of goddess Kali. All of us know that. So, you know that Khorgu is not used in order to murder a people, a person. 
it's used in order to sacrifice animals which is which is very important so sacrifice is the word is the key word so when you talk about de development development asks for sacrifice so some people will lose their land be it in the larger interest of the nation these are small sacrifices small sacrifice is a word is a term which nehru used when he was sort of commissioning hirakud dam in me almost immediately after independence so you get my point that it's not an ordinary weapon khorgo it's a very heavy sword which is used in order to sacrifice animals and sacrifice is what in order to prop propitiate the goddess so i think that these two things that there is no escape on the one hand and second that development requires sacrifice is 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 very very important and i think that that's that's what the poet shankho ghosh was was trying to trying to talk about so that's the essence of developmental nationalism that i am talking about all right so in in other words you know that the the connection between electoral majority and we the people of india can be established through what is called developmental democracy in other words it's a demos demos meaning people who will be soaked in democ in in development soaked in development in other words they have no escape and some of them must sacrifice at the altar of development so that's one in other words development nationalism is the key bridging point that connects the two the electoral majority and the people but then i say that there are two answers to this question of connecting the two what is the second way this second way is this that the electoral majority and the people are connected in the sense that th that both of them are based on certain universal principles and this actually you uni remember universal principles i said so you know that they are connected by way of sharing a set of common principles and that's the reason why i said universal principles and this actually reminds me of of b r ambedkar and his his insistence at whose insistence the phrase we the people of india was inserted into the constitution now what does this mean dr ambedkar made a distinction between indian nation and we the people of india he said that indian nation is not what the constitution declares as we the people of india why because indian nation which has historically evolved and which is divided into castes ethnicities hello the touchables and the untouchables and dr ambedkar categorically said that india is not a nation you read for instance his famous book annihilation of caste where he argues that hindus cannot constitute a nation because they are so much divided and divisions which actually go against the principles of equality justice dignity fraternity so he said that the nation cannot be we the people of india on the other hand he was actually when he when he was referring to we the people of india he was actually referring to an altogether different moral community and i said moral community why because it's a community which is bound together by way of sharing certain principles like equality all those principles which are laid down in the constitution in the preamble to the constitution for instance equality for instance 
for instance, uh, justice, for instance, uh, fraternity, so on and so forth. So you get my point that it, either it can be de developmental nationalism, which serves as a glue that binds the electoral majority and the people together, or it is, for instance, a set of moral principles, and I'm referring to Dr. Ambedkar, in order to sort of find out a theoretician who actually sort of provided this kind of argument. And remember that here, the electoral majority is a simple arithmetic sum. It cannot be identified with any particular community. For instance, you know that Hindus may be a majority in India, an overwhelming majority, but that doesn't mean that Hindus vote on block and they form the electoral majority. Electoral majority is is just an arithmetic sum and it's cleansed of its association with ethnicity, caste and what have you. If you read, for instance, Sheldon Wallin's famous book, uh, famous commentary on, on Tocqueville, he describes the electoral majority as an ideological cipher. It, it doesn't have any association with any ideology ethnicity, caste, religion, so on and so forth. It's simple, simple arithmetic sum which reflects the electoral outcome, the outcome of an election. All right. Let me now come over to the, uh, to the next part, the third part of my discussion, which is the characteristic features or or how can you theorize people in terms of in terms of uh, the sorry, characteristic I'm features? Sure I'm sorry, this is sorry. Uh, so some of the characteristic features, and I will sort of uh, try to cite uh, examples from from the Indian context. And I will refer to three characteristic features of the people. And remember, I'm talking about people as distinguished from the electoral majority. The first thing is this, that the first characteristic feature of the people is that the people may be defined as a combination of, of social majorities. And I use this term social majority deliberately because this is a term which which once again is being invoked and is in circulation for some time now and i use it in plural social majorities there is no one social majority in india social majority of varying life spans so you know that there is no sort of durable social majority it's a fleeting social majority, contingent social majority. And remember that a social majority which is, which is scattered at all different levels of the Indian society. Way back in 2005, Rajni Kothari said that, that may I make one request that please don't post anything on the chat box because that actually sort of distracts me. So you know that after I finish, then you sort of uh, post your questions on the chat box. I will be very happy to, to answer them. Uh, now, the, the point that I'm sort of trying to emphasize is, is very simple. That all you have to do in 2005, Rajni Kothari said, is to understand that the local forces have become much, much important. So much so that the national political parties find it difficult to appropriate and gobble them. 
In other words, you know that he was talking about irreducibility of the local. So a local leader who, for instance, controls the forces in Bhangor, and I'm citing this example because it has its very recent allusions. All of us are aware of it. And any national political party or any sort of political party which is very dominant at the center has to come to terms with, with this leader, this local leader. It's not the other way around. So you know that the local leader doesn't have to come doesn't have to come to an understanding with the central leadership, whether in Delhi or in Kolkata. But that it's the other way around. In other words, you know that the central leader, the local leader, the I'm sorry, the, the, the regional leader have to come to terms with them. It's, the, it's completely the other way around. And let me give you an example. Some of you might know, and I have written on that, that we were interested in sort of uh, at one point of time we became interested in 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 conducting a research on people who have been displaced by the erosion of river banks you know that in malda or in murshidabad this is a big problem because you know that the that the river constantly swings we were interested in studying how, for instance, the Ganga has changed its course during the last 100 years and how it has displaced people and with what effects. We found a leader in Malda who was very active in the sense that he was trying to organize and mobilize the victims and who was instrumental in sending deputations to the executive engineer of the irrigation department, so on and so forth. So he was a great organizer. So as we, as we interviewed him, we came to know that he was with the Communist Party of India even before the split. And after the split in 1964, if I'm not wrong, you know that the two parties, the CPIM split away from CPI. So he switched over to CPIM and he has been very active with this party. But then his party never supports his close association with the victims of riverbank erosion. Why? Because they don't think to be a very major issue in the district. So they say that it's a minority of people who are affected by riverbank erosion. But then he says that I have not paid heed to the dictates of, the, of my political party, knowing fully well that they, are, they might throw me out. And there have been occasions when he was about to be thrown out of the political party by thrown out of the political party. But that did not happen because you know that the party was also in a dilemma. And we also sort of uh, interviewed some of the local party leaders. The party leaders argued that if we throw him out, then probably we will alienate the victims of riverbank erosion. But then if we keep him within the party, then obviously people who are not affected by riverbank erosion will not like it. So we are in a moral dilemma and we don't know what to do with it. In other words, what I mean to say is this, that, the, that, the, that, that there has been a rise of the local, particularly in recent years. And what you see in the name of political party is actually a, some sort of a ragtag coalition of forces and it's very contingent and fleeting and that's probably the reason why you see people rapidly switching over from one political party to another hardly having any any fixed or durable loyalty to any political party 
So that's the first thing that when you talk about social majority, you actually talk about a medley of, of a number of social majorities who are strewn across different levels of Indian politics. The second is that if you define social majorities, I'm sorry, people as a combination of social majorities, then I immediately would hasten to add that it's very difficult to measure in very sort of in quantitative terms how much numerically dominant they are. It's very difficult to measure because there are no way by which you can actually quantify their strength. I give you an example. In 2007, you may have heard the name of Abdul Ghani Loan, who was one of the top leaders of all party Huriyat conference. All party Huriyat conference is, is branded as a separatist organization, which is a combination of a number of political forces. So he was one of the key founders of all party Huriyat conference. And if you and I had the opportunity of interviewing him, him in 2007. And let me sort of share some of the points which he tried to make. If you look at his career, he was earlier with Indian National Congress in, in the late 1960s, in the early 1960s. He was in fact a cabinet minister of Jammu and Kashmir Legislative Assembly. But then he tendered his resignation and he tendered his resignation on the ground that he was unable to voice his demand for self-determination of Kashmir. The Indian National Congress never supported his demand and whatever we mean by the demand for self-determination. He joined Janata Party in 1977. He was with Janata Party for till till its exit from political power in New Delhi. But then he formed his own party, which is called People's Conference. And you can describe it as the nucleus of today's all party Huriyat Conference. And then you know that he said, he pointed out, pointed it out to me with great pride that, that his party and the alliance called All Party Huriyat Conference is a very popular alliance in his own country, in his own place. And the word popular actually struck me. I asked him that, how do you know that you were popular? Because you have never contested election. And you know that All Party Huriyat Conference has consistently stayed away from elections since its birth. So how do you know that you are a popular force? This was a very difficult question and his answer was, we have our own ways of assessing people's mood. In other words, you know that it's, it's immeasurable. Popular support, social majority is immeasurable. You can't measure it. I forgot which year it was, but I guess that all party Huriyat conference set up its own election commission. Remember that we have state election commission, we have national election commission. But then all party Huriyat conference set up its own election commission and decided to conduct elections under its auspices at one point of time. I remember at that point of time, the minister of state for home affairs was Mr. I.D. Swami. And I.D. Swami dismissed it as ridiculous. This was his word. He said that this is ridiculous. There is only one election commission in India, which is the National Election Commission. You can't think of any other election commission. In other words, the sum and substance of all that I'm saying is that these social major majorities exist at the local level. They don't add up to form a national social majority, so to say. And, they, and these formations 
at the local level are immeasurable. You can't quantify them. They are unquantifiable. So this is the second characteristic feature. And the third characteristic feature is, and this has a relation to, uh, to, to Partho Chatterjee's famous book, Politics of the Governed, in which, for instance, Partho Chatterjee argued, and you know that the subtitle of this book is very important because it talks about politics of, I'm sorry, democratic politics of most of the world. So how democratic politics is actually conducted. And this book tells you that there are people whom you describe as social majority or whatever, who are co-opted into politics. So you know that they are not, and he makes a distinction between civil society and political society. I, don't, I just don't want to go, go into the details of it. But co-optation is the word. And Partho Chatterjee use, uses the term strategic politics, that they are actually part of the strategic politics. That they are used during elections. And there is an exchange relationship because they vote for a particular political party in exchange of something. It can be, for instance, cash transfer. It can be, for instance, housing. It can be, for instance, dole schemes, so on and so forth. Then you know what I mean. So you know that this, this is a, some sort of a strategic politics. And he, his argument was that democratic politics has become strategic politics. And that's the reason why he emphasized on, on mediation between these sets of people and the government. I will say that what I mean by what we mean by social majority refuses to be part of this strategic politics. So you know that they will say enough is enough. We don't want to be part of any kind of strategic politics. So they deliberately move away from it. And what do they do? They actually snap, snap, destroy the channels of communication. So you know that these social majorities thrive on snapping the mediation rather than establishing mediation. In other words, I would argue that much of today's developmental democracy lies in non-mediation or unmediation. And that's the reason why I use this word un, snapping mediation. So they don't want to be part of this strategic game that the political parties, that the pressure groups, interest groups, civil society or organizations want to play with them. They resolutely shun all such attempts. And then I will take just five minutes. If you read, and, and, and at, at, the, at the very end of my presentation, I don't know which book you refer to when you teach, for instance, political parties. But in our days, you know that teachers insisted on, 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 uh, on such book, uh, such a book, uh, which was written by Morris Duberger. Political parties is the title of the book. But I'm sure that not much has advanced since Duberger wrote this book. This was sometime in 1960s. I forgot which year it came out. If you read Duverger very carefully, this was a book which was initially written in French and subsequently translated into English. The emphasis is on mediation. So you know that the political parties act as a two-way communication between those who govern and those who are governed. The emphasis is on mediation. 
And you know that Duvarger's entire point was that the success of democracy lies in the efficiency of mediation. But I think that developmental democracy probably has come to a point where these channels of mediation are looked upon with suspicion. Because there are forces which actually try to snap this communication. And I will refer to three such, three such groups, three such forces. So if Duvarger has given you a typology of political parties, can we think in terms of some, can we think of, think, think in terms of an alternative typology of political forces, which actually strike at the very channels of communication. And I will refer to three of them. The first is distant. In other words, you know that there are political forces which try to keep distance from the government, as much distance as possible. And you can say that that's their way of, of seeking autonomy. So instead of asking something from the government, which is a very sort of governmental, government-centric politics, they keep distance. And in fact, you know that in, in, in contemporary political theory, much is being written on this concept of distance that there are political parties which always try to keep distance. And the theoretician whose name comes to my mind is Alain Badiou, a French theorist, who says that the challenge of democracy is to keep politics within its measure so that it doesn't sort of intervene, nibble and tweak into my, my domain so that I can breathe easy and without being interfered constantly by the government. So distance is a key word. And we can think of many, many, politi many political forces. Remember that these are political forces. They don't live in the Himalayas. They're very much part of us. But they, they, they just want to stay away from, from the government forces. So that's one. The second is what I would describe as experimental forces. So first is distant. The second is experimental. So these are forces which constantly experiment with different alternatives of development. So you know that if, for instance, you have state-initiated development or a kind of development which is being promoted by World Bank or, for instance, International Monetary Fund, you can think of political forces which are constantly experimenting with alternatives. I give you an example. Uh, now, uh, if I can remember correctly, you know that the famous singer from Assam, and all of us have heard his name, Zubin Garg. Zubin Garg and his wife are social activists. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. His wife runs an organization which is called, in Assam is it's called Thal Giri. In other words, basically you know that it means Giri, you know that Gandhi Giri or something like that. Thal means being indigenous. So they are experimenting with different kinds of organic food. They're experimenting with different kinds of local, locally made furniture and making them famous. Local books, books in Assamese. So you know that it's a it's a it's a different kind of movement 
which is going on, a kind of movement which actually at one point of time, Tushar Kanjilal initiated in the Sundarbans in Rangabelia, and much has been written on that, so I didn't pick up that, that example. So are there alternatives to development? In other words, development creates, creates a world which doesn't have any outside, in the sense that you can't you can't think in terms of alternative to development. Like I say that you, you have to develop, you, you have to, you are forced to develop. But then are there different ways of development? In fact, in Latin America, you have post-development theorists who have been insisting on these alternatives, experimenting with them. You can say that they have been unsuccessful but that something is unsuccessful, uh, unsuccessful doesn't mean that they don't have any value. Success is a different thing. The third is what I would describe as vigilant groups. They exercise vigilance, monitoring of the society. And you know that I, I someone of us whom I know very well, he teaches in one of the universities in, in, in Lucknow. I'm sorry, in Kanpur. And he has conducted a research on an, an organization which is called Gulabi Gang. Gang, you know, it's a, it's a band of women who wear pink, Gulabi. And what do they do? They are basically poor subaltern women. So what do they do? They meet out summary justice. For instance, if a local block development officer is corrupt, then they go with sticks, with lattice, vandalize the BDO office. If the husband of, of, a, of a woman is an alcoholic, he is beaten and he is taught a less, lesson. So you know that these vigil, I'm, I'm sort of citing an extreme example, but there are examples of, of, of this nature. In other words, you know that none of them, distant, experimental or vigilante, looks upon the government as a be-all and end-all. And that's the reason why I say probably that democracy is de democracy today is not so much nested in institutions. When you talk about democracy, what do you think of? You think of parliament, you think of cabinet, you think of president, you think of judiciary. But nowadays, probably you think a different kind of democracy, which is taking place beyond the setup of institutions. And I'm talking about these forces. So it's important that we teach our students these experiences, that democracy beyond institutions. And I end up with, with a quotation, with a quote from, a, from an octogenarian farmer who was sitting in Dharna on the outskirts of Delhi and he said, and you know that they were, the, the farmers organizations were holding what is called Kisan Sangsads or peasant parliaments. And remember that peasant parliament sessions were being held near Delhi, not too far from Indian parliament, parliament of India. So when he was asked by Rajdeep Sardesai of one of the English channels, national TV channels, that parliament is sitting a few miles away from where you are sitting. So why don't you go to parliament and submit your memorandum? Because parliament is a, is a nerve center of legislations. They make laws. And you know what his reply was? His reply was, Kanun Sarakpei Banta. In other words, laws are made. 
on the streets, on the roads. So I think that you need to, you need to understand that democracy probably has, has deserted the institutions. I know I'm being from provocative, but thank you, thank you for your patience and I would very much love to answer your questions, your comments, your queries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Das. What an excellent exposition with so many takeaways that I learned. Uh, the last being that, you know, democracy has left the institutions. Indeed provocative. Uh, I shall not stand between the questions and comments that will come. Uh, so I believe there are already uh, some in the chat box. Uh, Will you take the question in the chat box first and then wait for the hands to be raised? Yes, there is one question. And one question. Yes. Do you think that farmers who block the national highway for a long time, causing a lot of problems to the common people, is justified in a democratic country in the name of community of interest of a, or in the name of community interest of a group? Dr. Shushanta Kumar Kaur, leader in political science, Kotak Oisa. So my... Professor, just before, sorry to intervene, I just want to make a point, is that whoever would like to make a question, please raise your hands, we'll get back to you. Please carry on, Professor. Okay. Now, uh, I think that the... Uh, you know that... Uh, that the important question is that how can you actually make yourself hard. Uh, if, for instance, the, if, if, for instance, nobody pays heed to you. Uh, in other words, what I mean to say is this, and in fact, you know that long back, I read a piece which was written by, uh, by uh, Jyotirindra Dasgupta. Now, Jyotirindra Dasgupta used to teach uh, political science at the University of California in Berkeley. He actually studied from uh, my department, Department of Political Science, Calcutta University. And his famous thesis is on language politics. All of us are aware of it. But then he was talking about deafness of the state. Deafness. If, for instance, the state doesn't like to hear you, has developed deafness, then what do you do? You keep shouting. But even then, you know that you always sort of escalate from one level to another in order to make him listen. If, for instance, he doesn't listen to you, what do you do? You just sort of shake him so that you become audible. In other words, you know that the this is a very sort of very interesting analogy that he drew between a deaf state and for instance those who want to make their voices heard at the nerve center of politics. So in that sense, you know, it, it's not a question of justice, whether they are justified or not. But then you know that uh, the argument, in other words, you know that, let me make just one point that if you refer to the farmers agitation, the farmers were constantly saying that we go by the constitution, a constitution which in fact respects our right to equality, right to justice, the principle of fraternity. So you know that we go by that. So we are not doing anything unconstitutional. We go by the constitutional principles. But then what do you do? It's, a, it's probably the last resort that the, that the farmers were doing. And this is how, for instance, people articulate their voices. So you know that I think this is a very important point. This has to, a lot to do with the distinction that I made between uh, electoral majority and the people. You know, electoral majority is constituted through the instruments provided by the constitution, by the law of the land. But the social majority is constituted 
in terms of the principles that the constitution uphold and celebrate rather than by the modalities by the instrumentalities provided by that so i i will stop here and let's hear if there is any other question i don't think there is yes there is one more question no oh, no this is for the participants কারোর কোনো প্রশ্ন যদি বাংলাতেও স্যারকে করতে চান আপনার প্রফেসর দাসকে প্লিজ বাংলাতে উনি বলেছেন যে উনি উত্তর নিশ্চয়ই দেবেন আমার মনে হয় এটা একটা খুব ভালো সুযোগ এত ভালো একটা আলোচনা পরে আমার মনে হয় যে প্রশ্ন থাকাটা খুব স্বাভাবিক develop. So, maybe i do not like that narrative of development so should there be a much more uh, granular approach to the understanding of what should be development and should there be juxtaposition of multiple multiple narratives of what can be conceived as development uh, and probably with that also comes this question of whose development and for whom the development is directed because as you said in the electoral politics the electoral constituency and the larger constituency of people living in a country are different so how does one arrive at some sort of an understanding a consensus as to whose development how development and how many narratives of development especially in a country like india ek to kani ami banglay uttor di jodi ekdom ekdom please shobai english te hoyeche kintu ek to arbhanar jonno bodhay ek to banglay dui ekta kotha bola jetei pare ekta ei proshno ta kena du bhabe dekha jay যে শব্দটা তুমি বললে সেটা হচ্ছে গ্র্যানিউলার ডেভেলপমেন্ট আমাদের মতো আমরা যখন ধর যখন আমরা ডেভেলপমেন্টের কথা বলি তখন আমরা একটা বিশেষ ধরনের ডেভেলপমেন্টের কথা বলি তো যেটার মধ্যে একটা নিজস্ব পাওয়ার রয়েছে অর্থাৎ আমি একসময় আর্গুমেন্ট করেছিলাম যে দি স্টেট ইজ নট সভরেইন প্রবাবলি দি প্রবাবলি ডেভেলপমেন্ট ইজ সভরেইন ডেভেলপমেন্টটা আমাদেরকে তৈরি করে দিচ্ছে আমি শুধু একটা কথা এখানে বলি সেটা হচ্ছে যে ডেভেলপমেন্ট লিটারেচারে একটা উন্নয়ন সম্বন্ধে ধারণার ক্ষেত্রে একটা বড় পরিবর্তন সাম্প্রতিককালে লক্ষ্য করা যাচ্ছে সেই পরিবর্তনটা হচ্ছে যে ডেভেলপমেন্টটা অর্থাৎ উন্নয়ন আমি কি হব সেটা আমায় বলবে না বরং উল্টোটা করবে সেটা হচ্ছে আমি কি হব সেটা হতে পারার সামর্থ্য যোগাবে in other words to be able to develop becomes the goal of development rather than to make you what the planners of development actually want you to be অর্থাৎ আমার সামর্থ্য তৈরি করে দেয়া হচ্ছে উন্নয়নের কাজ সেই সামর্থ্যটা দিয়ে আমি কি হব সেটা আমি তৈরি করব আমি আমি আমার মতন করে আমি নিজেকে তৈরি করব এই সামর্থ্য নির্মাণ যদি আমি এই শব্দটা ব্যবহার করি তাহলে এখনকার লিটারেচারে কিন্তু এটার একটা 
বড় জায়গা এসছে এবং যেটা নিয়ে অনেকে নানান ধরনের কথাবার্তা বলছেন আমরা এগুলোকে নানান ভাষায়ও বল শব্দগুলোকে ব্যবহার করছি যেমন ক্যাপেবিলিটি যেটা অমর্ত সেনের ক্যাপেবিলিটি যে আমার আমি কতটা করতে সমর্থ এবং যেটাকে আমি মনে করি আমি আমার নিজের পরিস্ফুটন হবে সেইটা হতে পারার ক্ষমতা কি আনার আমি পাই সেই ক্ষমতায়নটা কি আমাকে করে দেয়া হয় এইটা একটা বড় ধরনের পরিবর্তন এক ধরনের এসছে এবং সেটা যদি হয় তাহলে সবাই তাসের দেশের মতো এক ছাঁচে আমরা তৈরি হব না আমরা বিভিন্ন বিভিন্ন ভাবে নিজেদেরকে নির্মাণ করে নিতে পারব হয়তো সেটা তোমার ওই গ্র্যানিউলার অ্যাপ্রোচ টু ডেভেলপমেন্টের এক ধরনের চেহারা আমরা লক্ষ্য করতে পারি এটা একটা দুই আরেকটা একটা আরেকটা এক্সট্রিম লক্ষ্য করা যাচ্ছে সেটাও অবশ্য ইদানিংকালের লিটারেচারে আমরা লক্ষ্য করতে পারছি সেটা হচ্ছে যে ধরো যে সে নো টু ডেভেলপমেন্ট এবং এটা একটা ধরো আমি বলবো যে একটা এক ধরনের এক্সট্রিমিস্ট রিয়াকশন টু টু ডেভেলপমেন্ট যে ধরো অনেকে অনেক এক্সপেরিমেন্ট হচ্ছে ইদানিংকালে যে যারা বলছে যে না আমরা অর্গ্যানিক ফুড ছাড়া খাবো না ফর ইনস্ট্যান্স আমরা অর্গ্যানিক কালটিভেশন ছাড়া চাষ করব না তো এবং সেইটা সেইটা এক আরেকটা জায়গায় আমাদেরকে নিয়ে যাবে যেখানে ধরো উই উইল সে নো টু ডেভেলপমেন্ট এবং তার একটা এক্সট্রিম এক্সাম্পল আমি দিচ্ছি সেটা হচ্ছে যে ধরো এই যে মার্কিন যুক্তরাষ্ট্রে ওদের নিয়ে অনেকগুলো কাজও আছে পেন্সিলভেনিয়ার অ্যামিশ কমিউনিটি ফর ইনস্ট্যান্স দি অ্যামিশ কমিউনিটি ফর ইনস্ট্যান্স দে ডোন্ট ইউজ ইলেকট্রিসিটি দে ডোন্ট ইউজ ফর ইনস্ট্যান্স ক্লোথস ইন দ্য সেন্স ইন উইচ উই ইউজ দেম দে ডোন্ট সেন্ড দেয়ার চিলড্রেন টু স্কুলস তাহলে এইটা এক ধরনের আরেকটা ধরনের ফলে এই যে নানান ধরনের কিন্তু এক্সপেরিমেন্ট চলছে আরেকটা ধরো আর আরেকটা এক্সপেরিমেন্টের কথা আমি বলতে পারি বিশেষ করে উত্তর পূর্ব ভারতের কনটেক্সটে সেটা হচ্ছে যে অনেক ইনসার্জেন্ট অর্গানাইজেশন তারা প্রায় গান পয়েন্টে ধরো বাধ্য করছে যে যারা বড় লোক ধরো আমার ট্রান্সপোর্টের বিজনেস আছে তাদেরকে বাধ্য করা হচ্ছে যে কতগুলো ট্রাক লরি সাধারণ মানুষের কাজের জন্য ব্যবহার করতে দিতে হবে এবং দে থিঙ্ক ইট টু বি পার্ট অফ the duty of those who, who are rich towards the society in other words they, they consider it as a moral duty tale tar ekta redistributive effect samaje ache bhalo ki mondo amader mane dhoro jodi shokti proyog kore kauke baddho kora hoy tale ganatantra koto ta thakbe seta abar onno dhoroner proshno asche but you have all these kinds of experiments which are going on i think that all of them can be collapse together under your category of granular approach to development ebong amar mone hoy je ei dhoroner development gulo hocche kintu ami at the same time bolbo je eta niye khub amader je alladito howa ba anondito howar kono karon nei karon development tar nijoshyo logic ei manuske baddho korche tar rastay egote তার রাস্তা মানে ডেভেলপমেন্ট তৈরি করে দিচ্ছে আমার রাস্তাটা কি হবে আমি ঠিক করে দিচ্ছি না আমার উন্নয়নের রাস্তাটা কি হবে এইটুকুই আমার এই মুহূর্তে বলবার আর কারোর কোন প্রশ্ন বা মন্তব্য এইটা একটা প্রশ্ন দেখা যাচ্ছে আমি একটা চ্যাট বক্সে এসছে My, my question is what do you think what will be a proper approach that government may follow before formulating any policy or decision which will ensure development as well as people's participation because as prime minister said it's somrit kal for development ami jini proshno korechen tini bangla janen kina jani na ami ingrejite uttor ta di I don't know what the Prime Minister or Honourable Prime Minister will say, but 
you know that i can say like i responded while uh, i i responded to ishani uh, and i said that there are different ways of uh, of developing oneself so if for instance all of us are cast in the same mold of development then obviously all of us will try to become what amrito sen once said a country of first boy so we are a country of first boy amra shobai first hote chai lekha pora korte chai kintu je chhele ta bhalo chobi ake ba je bhalo ranna kore she hoyto porikkhay bhalo number pay na kintu tar kono স্বীকৃতি নেই আমাদের সমাজে তাহলে আমাদের তো আমরা তো নিজেকে কি করব তার একটা স্বাধীনতা থাকার দরকার কিন্তু সেই স্বাধীনতাটা এইটা দাবি করে যে আমি সেটা হতে পারার মতন সামর্থ্য আমাকে সমাজ দেয় কি না অর্থাৎ আমার লিটারেসি আছে আমার শিক্ষা আছে আমার স্বাস্থ্য ঠিক আছে আমার স্বাস্থ্য সুযোগ পাই আমি দুবেলা খেতে পাই তাহলে এই জন্য অমর্ত সেন বা অন্যান্যরা কতগুলো বললেন যে এই সামর্থ্য তৈরি করবার জন্য কতগুলো বিষয় দরকার যেমন স্বাস্থ্য যেমন শিক্ষা এই দুটোর উপরে তারা খুব জোর দিলেন হিউম্যান ডেভেলপমেন্টের কথা বললেন তাদের বক্তব্য হচ্ছে যে দিস ক্যাপেবিলিটিস উইল অ্যালাউ মি টু বিকাম তারপরে আমি অমর্ত সেনের তিনটে চারটে শব্দ বলছি কারণ এটাকে রিপ্লেস করা যাবে না in order to become what i have reasons to value orthat amar ami jetake mulloban mone kori amar jonno seta howar jonno amar samarthyo dewa tai hocche unnoyon ami ki hobo seta bole dewar noy so i think i could make my point clear that they see development more as a means rather than an end a, this is and i think it's a very pertinent question and this is a question which comes uh, comes in in other words i think that this is a direct connection to democracy in the sense that democracy is not what others want you to become democracy is what you yourself want to become allowing you to become what you want to become that's democracy যে এই যে সেলফ ফরমেশন যে আমি নিজেকে কাদার মতন আমি মাটি কাদার মতন তৈরি করে নিতে পারি নির্মাণ করতে পারি ভাঙতে পারি আবার নতুন করে গড়তে পারি এটাই হচ্ছে গণতন্ত্র কিন্তু গণতন্ত্র তো ওটা নয় যে আমাকে একভাবে তৈরি করে দিল এইটাই তোমার উন্নয়ন লেখাপড়া শিখে সবাইকে ফার্স্ট বয় হতে হবে এইটাই তোমার উন্নয়ন দ্যাটস নট ডেভেলপমেন্ট সেটা আসলে গণতন্ত্রের কণ্ঠ রোধ করে দ্যাটস হোয়াট আই ওয়ান্ট টু সে যে গণতন্ত্র মানে যে সবাইকে ওই হাইড্রো ইলেকট্রিক স্টেশনই তৈরি করতে হবে বড় বড় রাস্তা তৈরি করতে হবে মানুষকে উৎখাত করতে হবে হাজার হাজার মানুষকে উৎখাত করতে হবে নো ডেমোক্রেসি ইজ নট দ্যাট ডেমোক্রেসি ইজ দ্য ফ্রিডম টু মেক ওয়ান সেলফ মেক অ্যান্ড রিমেক ওয়ান সেলফ এইটা হচ্ছে গণতন্ত্র থ্যাংক ইউ বাট দিস ইজ এ ভেরি পার্টিনেন্ট কোয়েশ্চেন আর কারোর কোনো প্রশ্ন বা কিছু বক্তব্য যদি থাকে আমাদের কাছে সময় কিন্তু এবারে কমে আসছে ফলে কারোর যদি কোনো প্রশ্ন না থাকে এখানে অনেক আমি ছাত্রছাত্রী ধর্মীছে আছে তারা তাদের কোনো প্রশ্ন নেই স্যারকে তাহলে আমি ধরে নিচ্ছি আর তাও কোনো জিজ্ঞাসা বা প্রশ্ন নেই আমি প্রফেসর অপূর্ব মুখোপাধ্যায়কে অনুরোধ করব উনি এবার আনুষ্ঠানিকভাবে ধন্যবাদ জ্ঞাপন করে এই বক্তৃতামালা সম্পন্ন করব নমস্কার সবাইকে আমরা অনেকক্ষণ ধরে আজকের মূল আলোচক অধ্যাপক সমীর কুমার দাসের আলোচনা শুনলাম আমি ব্যক্তিগতভাবে একটি কথা উল্লেখ করতে চাই অধ্যাপক সমীর কুমার দাস আমার শ্রদ্ধেয় শিক্ষক আমি 
আজকে খুব আনন্দিত আমার খুব আনন্দ হচ্ছে যে আজকে আমাদের ওয়েস্ট বেঙ্গল পলিটিক্যাল সায়েন্স অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের যে ওয়েবিনার তাতে উনি এসেছেন এবং আমাদের অনুরোধ রক্ষা করে এরকম একটা মনোগ্রাহী আলোচনা যা ইনসাইটফুল একটা আলোচনা উনি করেছেন যার থেকে আমরা অনেক উপকৃত কাজে আমি আমার মাস্টারমশাইকে ওয়েস্ট বেঙ্গল পলিটিক্যাল সায়েন্স অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের পক্ষ থেকে কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি এবং ব্যক্তিগতভাবে আমি ওনার কাছে ঋণী এবং আমি ওনাকে আমার প্রণাম জানাচ্ছি আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি আমাদের অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের ভাইস প্রেসিডেন্ট যাদবপুর ইউনিভার্সিটির আন্তর্জাতিক সম্পর্কের অধ্যাপিকা ঈশানি নস্করকে যিনি আজকের এই আলোচনার সঞ্চালকের দায়িত্ব পালন করেছেন উনি আমাদের এই ওয়েবিনার যাতে সম্পূর্ণভাবে সফল হতে পারে তার জন্য নানা রকম পরামর্শ দান করেন এবং আমাদেরকে একদম সক্রিয় সহযোগিতা করে থাকেন কাজে আমরা আর একবার তার কাছে কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি আমি কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি এবং ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি যার নিরলস পরিশ্রম ছাড়া আমরা এই ওয়েবিনার সার্থক করতে পারি না সে হচ্ছে আমাদের অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের কোষাধ্যক্ষ অধ্যাপক কৌশিক চক্রবর্তী কৌশিক প্রত্যেকটা ওয়েবিনারে যেমন করে তার পরিশ্রমের মাধ্যমে আমাদের ওয়েবিনারকে সফল করে আমি সুযোগ পাই না এবার সুযোগ পেয়েছি কাজে ওকে আমাদের ব্যক্তিগতভাবে এবং অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের পক্ষ থেকে ওর প্রতি কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি ঝিলমের প্রতি যে ঝিলম আমাদের যে ইউটিউব আমরা এই গুগল মিটের সঙ্গে সঙ্গে আমরা ইউটিউব লিঙ্কে আমাদের যে কাজটা হয় সেই গোটা কাজটা ঝিলম পরিচালনা করে কাজে ঝিলমকে আমাদের অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের পক্ষ থেকে আমি ধন্যবাদ এবং কৃতজ্ঞতা জানাচ্ছি আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আমাদের অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের সভাপতি অধ্যাপক পঞ্চানন চট্টোপাধ্যায় মহাশয়কে প্রত্যেকটা ওয়েবিনারের ক্ষেত্রে উনি যে পরামর্শ দেন সেই পরামর্শ ওয়েবিনার সফল করার জন্য আমাদের কাছে একটা পথ নির্দেশ বলে মনে হয় কাজে আমি তার প্রতি আমার কৃতজ্ঞতা প্রকাশ করছি পরিশেষে আমি সমস্ত এই ওয়েবিনারের যে সকল অধ্যাপক অধ্যাপিকা ছাত্রছাত্রী তারা এসে হাজির হন যাদের উপস্থিতি ছাড়া আমরা এই ওয়েবিনারকে কখনোই কল্পনা করতে পারি না সফলভাবে পরিচালনা করার জন্য সেই সমস্ত শক্তি মণ্ডলীকে আমি অ্যাসোসিয়েশনের পক্ষ থেকে আমাদের ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আর প্রসঙ্গক্রমে বলে রাখি যে আমরা একটা ফিডব্যাক লিঙ্ক আমরা দিয়েছি সেই ফিডব্যাক লিঙ্কটাতে গিয়ে আপনারা ফিডব্যাক ফর্মটা পূরণ করবেন তাহলে ই সার্টিফিকেট আমরা আপনারা সকলেই পেয়ে যাবেন যারা আজকের এই ওয়েবিনারে উপস্থিত হয়েছেন সকলকে আর একবার ধন্যবাদ জানিয়ে আমার কথা শেষ করছি শুভ রাত্রি স্যারকে আর একবার আমার প্রণাম জানাচ্ছি প্রকাশ করছেন আজকের আলোচনার জন্য ধন্যবাদ অপূর্ব ভালো দেবো থ্যাংক ইউ সমীর দা থ্যাংক ইউ পরে কথা হবে অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ অপূর্ব দা হ্যাঁ গুড নাইট শেষ করছি পরে ফোন করব। Sure. Sure.